save our planet. That's cool. And I imagine you find it so because you're here. So I would like to welcome, first of all, uh, my, oh, my iPad has been swapped. <laughs> Sorry, I would like to welcome my panelists first. So we have Aidan O'Sullivan, uh, Natasha McCarthy, Maria Ortiz, Ortiz Perez, I think so. <laughs> Perez Ortiz, sorry. And um, Ali Mitchell. Thank you. Um, so I want to give a sh uh, sorry. I want to give a shout out to Slido. Oh my! Why is that? Do I get to? I'll sit here. No, I don't do. want to be so far away. <laughs> so we have Slido. So please join us, people in person or online. If you have any questions you want, please. Um, this is the Slido, this is the research stage Slido, and we're going to have soon, the top questions are going to show up here. <coughs> so we will have now our panelists introducing themselves for a second. I will have the first question to just, you know, break the ice, get them comfortable, and then we'll go to audience questions and I'll continue with my questions. Does that sound okay? Does that sound okay to you guys? Great! <laughs> so we'll start at the far back, please. Hi everybody, my name is Natasha McCarthy. I'm an Associate Director at the Royal Academy of Engineering, which is the UK's National Academy of Engineering. I lead our engineering policy work. That's done primarily through the National Engineering Policy Centre, which is a partnership between all of the UK's professional engineering institutions. I've also done work in the past on digital and data technology policy, especially thinking about how we can use digital and uh, data-driven technologies for societal benefit, including decarbonisation and sustainability. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of the conversation today, so thank you. Thank you. Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, my name's uh, Alistair Mitchell. Everyone calls me Ali. Um, I am a founder, um, primarily from the UK, been doing um, B2B software, um, data, AI, now hardware, for 20 years, and then I became an investor on the dark side about six, seven years ago um, uh, at, at a big fund called EQT Ventures. I spent 10 years in the Valley, came back to the UK just last year, so it's great to be here. Um, done a bunch of um, uni spin-out investing, um, all the way through to big kind of pre-IPO software businesses. Um, so super excited, and I think we all know the answer to the whole world of the question, which is yes, yeah, I can save the world. Um, so let's explore how we can. Great to be here. Uh, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Perez Ortiz. I'm a lecturer or assistant professor at UCL at the AI Center and Department of Computer Science. And for the last 12 years, I've been spending my time doing innovation in AI technologies for social and environmental sustainability, different topics there, climate change, biomedicine, sustainable agriculture, and many other things. And this recently has crystallized in the creation of a program at UCL on AI for sustainable development, which I'm directing at the moment. And there we teach AI engineers about topics related to sustainability, ethics, responsible innovation, and how this intersects with AI. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and my topic of research essentially is um, AI safety, so how to innovate responsibly within this topic, but I'm also very interested in ecology, policy, and education, because I think those are the best tools that we have at the moment to deal with some of the challenges we are facing, and I'm sure those topics will come in the conversation. Thank you. And uh, my coach buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello everyone, I'm Aidan O'Sullivan. Uh, I'm an associate professor at UCL Energy Institute and a Turing fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. So great to be here and uh, great to see so much activity in the Turing uh, around this topic. Uh, I'm also recently, in the last two years, I've co-founded a spin-out from UCL uh, in partnership with Cambridge called Carbon Re. And we're looking to use AI to decarbonize uh, heavy industry and the manufacture of cement, steel, glass, and other foundational materials that we need for society. So my research has always been aligned in terms of deploying AI in the energy space or in the sustainability space, whether that's through reinforcement learning, optimization of the grid, or whether it's through kind of predictive uh, models of uh, material properties. That's where I've been focused and what I've spent the last two years doing is trying to translate that into innovation and impact and to actually build a climate tech uh, company that can scale to have uh, gigatons of impact. So that's what I think we need to do with AI and the technology is to take it out into the world and to use it to have real impact on the uh, climate change problem that we are facing. Um, thank you so much for, for giving a short 
<laughs> introduction <laughs> to your work, because I'm, I'm sure you could have given a longer one. So I want to open up with the first question to actually get some definition. So what does exactly AI for the planet mean, in your personal opinion, and your, the work that you do in your field? Um, so I guess I'll start with Ali, please. Well, I think from, from where I sit, I mean, there was the phrase of the very famous Andreessen phrase a few years ago, software is eating the world. I think we can all see now that AI is about to eat the world. And hopefully, though, this is in a good way. I think that's what there'll be a lot of good discussion here about. But from my perspective, I think it, it's, it's the rapid application now of new techniques to so many what seem to be intractable problems of just a few years ago. Um, and that's why I think it's particularly exciting to climate, just because the scope of some of these problems are so big. If you're talking about the, the biological world, materials, the atomic world, um, some of these problems have been, frankly, beyond some of our computational efforts. And so you bring AI into this. This allows us to come up with all sorts of hugely innovative solutions for what is, as we all know, the most pressing environmental problem. And there's been so much software thrown at this. Um, climate software has been a big boom area. But frankly, it's, it's just scratching the surface of true fundamental foundational change. And I think that's what, for me, what is so exciting about it is the, the, the power to unlock um, solutions to so many huge, huge problems. Um, thank you. Natasha? Thank you. So when I think about AI for the planet, I guess um, in my mind I distinguish between AI as a technology and AI as a tool. So if you think about AI as a technology, and it is a, you know, a, a very transformative, fundamental technology that can enable lots of applications, AI has to be for the planet because right now all technology has to be for the planet. Whatever we're doing, whether it's thinking about mobility, healthcare, and manufacturing, and the systems, the energy systems that support all of those, all of those have to be focused very intently now on decarbonisation and reaching net zero. So AI for the planet fundamentally is creating AI systems that are sustainable, that we're aware of their kind of carbon and energy footprint, that that is managed, and that the technologies are used appropriately and proportionately so they do not create extra energy demand beyond what is valuable and they do not create a carbon imprint uh, that you know, could be managed. But then as a tool, just as Ali said, I think there's some phenomenal opportunities for using AI on that journey towards decarbonisation and supporting what is done in other sectors. And you need to you know, go downstairs, there's some phenomenal activities going on and it's brilliant to see that. So I think for me, AI for the planet is showing that the really, the most important thing that we could use this multi-purpose tool for is thinking about how we decarbonise. That's my main focus for what I do, but of course, bigger challenges around biodiversity, land use and adaptation too. So it is the sort of primary purpose of this phenomenal tool we're building. Thank you. Aidan. Uh, thanks. So AI for the planet is, I mean, what it means to me is a vision and an ambition. And if you think of the trajectory of AI and where we were, say, 10 years ago, it shows the progress that we now have of you know, moving away from lab benches and looking to be deploying this in the world and looking to have impact at massive scale. So the fact that we're talking about or saying things like AI for the planet just shows the progress that we've made and shows what's possible as the technology in terms of the potential that it has and the scale and the way that we deploy it and the considerations that we take into account. It's a very important conversation that needs to be had in terms of what we do and what people are working on and the way that they're approaching the technology and the way they see it as well. So it's a really good lens to view a lot of the research that we're taking, taking on board and doing at the Turing. Thank you. Maria? Thank you. Um, so I think for me, um, I, I once heard that sustainability is about partnerships. So for me, AI for the Planet is very much around that topic of partnerships, so partnerships across different domains with different stakeholders, with people coming from different um, knowledge areas and so on. Um, but also partnerships with areas such as AI for social good or sustainable AI, which are having slightly different um, agenda, so to say. So for example, it would not only be AI for sustainability, but also making AI sustainable. So um, making it fair, making it uh, robust, making it interpretable, making it work for humans, essentially. And I think within that domain, really thinking about the interconnectedness of our system. So it's not only about environmental sustainability, but also social sustainability and economic sustainability, and how all of those three systems are linked together and interact very much one with each other. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much for all your answers. And I will go to my first slider question. I hope we can show it on screen because it goes into what I wanted to ask. Because I feel like we cannot talk about AI for the planet and not talk about the consequences of having so much computing <laughs> on AI and all of these technologies. So as for the top question is, 
do you think there should be a compute te- tax to offset environmental impact of training these huge models in the future and I guess already now? So does anyone want to go first on this one? <gasps> Tough one. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a really interesting question and I think that I'm not sure that you know, a compute tax is a particular solution, but I do think we need to think about how we manage and create incentives to manage the footprint of computing. Uh, And that's both in terms of thinking about, as I said, using the technology appropriately and proportionately, so how how you make sure there's incentive to do that, but also using innovation uh, capacity to think about lower power computation as well, so thinking about technological, um, not solutions, but technological approaches that can help reduce that. I don't know the solution, but it's something that has to be thought about very openly uh, and thinking about that in a way that enables the best use of the technology. So making sure that any solution won't, say, disproportionately impact smaller companies uh, that will enable people to engage with the technology globally. So I think it's an important question. I couldn't jump to an answer, but I think that thinking needs to happen. I think think maybe at risk of sounding too libertarian. So first of all, I totally agree. I think... The uh, sound of Ritzing too libertarian, which I'm not, or too capitalist, which I probably am, <laughs> um, being a VC. Um, the, I think the, mark, the most interesting and I think exciting move, especially in Europe, because this isn't going on in the US, um, has been the incorporation, actually the, the biggest move in climate tech of being energy. Um, and it comes even from the people on this pa- pla- panel. Um, because actually, if you look at where investment's going in in climate, the number one area is energy, and that's been driven out of Europe specifically by the crisis that we've seen in Ukraine with rising fuel prices, which has affected everyone, no matter where you are in in, in the world. Um, And that is actually now just having a very direct impact because it is naturally sustaining people to think about, okay, not only sources of energy, but actually how do we, all of these huge compute areas, how do we reduce their energy consumption? How do we reduce, frankly, just from a cost perspective and availability perspective? And then there are even AI solutions to now manage, to help to manage energy itself. But I think that coming in at the top is almost a foundational piece, energy being the most, and where actually where the most money is going. If you just look at where infrastructure investment's going, it's in energy right now. That, that to me is amazing exciting because I think it, it won't necessarily solve this problem, but it at least is a huge offset without before we have to start worrying about legislation and, and taxation and, and so on. So I think that's been a massively positive one. But it's very interesting because it's a very European perspective. If, if I were sitting in the US, first of all, uh, climate is extremely politicized between Democrats and Republicans. And secondly, energy is very politicized. So it's, it's very unique to us to think about worrying about energy. In the US, you just don't worry about it. You think, oh, we'll just we'll pump more shale. Um, but, but it's amazing as, as these solutions become lower and lower cost, how that is now becoming a capital question um, to so- hopefully to solve this <coughs> once and for all. That's such an interesting thing that it, there's a difference between um, these two hubs. Does anyone want to add anything? I think uh, connecting to what you just said, Ali, I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of research, in terms of computer science and the AI world actually pushing towards not bigger models every time, but actually thinking about how can we build simpler models that maybe have that are much more compute efficient and that might be better. So, for example, we have the, the work of uh, Cindy Rudin who has a very nice talk on do simpler machine learning models exist and where to find them. And actually she shows that for many data sets, simpler models are good enough and actually they, they are interpretable. They, you can, um, uh, for example, understand them to find the models that actually match human intuition the best so that you can avoid, for example, spurious correlations and then they are more robust. So I think uh, going in that direction could be something really good and we have the whole field of green computing which is doing amazing things in that direction of trying to really um, put down the compute resources that we need for these models. And we have as well a lot of new research in terms of scaling loss. So how do these big deep (coughs) neural networks scale with different parameters and so on. And what we are finding is that not every time we need bigger models. So I think that's very important for the field. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? Uh, just to add, I mean, the question is really about data centers, essentially, which is where a lot of this compute takes place. Now, Ireland recently refused permission to build another data center uh, because of the stress it would have placed on the electricity grid at the time. Uh, and there is a form of a tax in terms of the electricity price. So if you're consuming energy when the electricity price is very high, um, you are being taxed for that compute. Now, whether there should be something specific to computing and the way that electricity used, that's a very interesting question, and it does kind of bring in other 
other aspects of what we're using energy for and at what times and whether things should turn off or whether they should be incentivized to do so. But the policy angle around the specific use of energy, I think is probably a bit too draconian in a sense, and it's better to tackle that through price regulation. So you can get a data center switching to reserve power at a certain time to save cost and save energy, but this drive towards more efficient usage of energy through simpler models or smaller models is really interesting. And if you think about the, uh, we often like to make you know allegories or metaphors with the brain in terms of AI, the brain is incredibly energy efficient in terms of compute, and that's where we really struggle to match um, you know, the performance and characteristics. So if we were to put more effort and research effort into matching the compute per, uh, per watt, then that would be a really good way to start to address some of that failings and would be a really profitable and uh, worthwhile uh, investment of research. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, it's too cheap uh, is the problem. Um, for a second, I thought you were going to go the matrix route, <laughs> that um, humans are better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna, I was going to ask something else, but we have a very high rising question that keeps coming to the top. Um, and I guess everyone might, might be interested. So let's go the capitalist route. Um, if you had one billion pounds um, and you could only spend it on either investing in solutions for, for climate change or climate reparations, which one would you choose? And climate reparations meaning solutions to solve specific problems, I guess is the today. Or sol remediating problems that currently exist, I guess is that the, should we go with that? What's the, you want to give a specific meaning to the word reparations? So okay, go on, go on. What did you mean? What did you mean by the question? Uh, giving money to countries most affected by... Got it. I, I will yeah, repeat great. it so that people that... Uh, yeah, so, the, so the answer was, so the first one, A, is pretty clear, but B, what, what you meant by climate reparations was money specifically for countries most affected by um, climate change. Great question. Um, well, I think first of all, maybe not answering the question, but one billion is a very small amount of money, actually, in, in the scheme of things. I know it feels like a lot of money, but the good news is, is that the amount of money flowing into this space now is, measured, is being measured in the hundreds of billions and trillions. So um, I'm very lucky to work in a fund that is a, a billion euros. Um, I'm talking right now to three other funds that I know of that are being formed that we want advice that are all north of that, um, and they're all fo focused on climate. So the point is, is there is a lot of money flowing, um, if you put it in that, the reason why I start with that, though, is because if you put it in the context of that, where do you think you get the most leverage? A, a billion isn't actually that much money, and certainly if you apply it to reparations, is a, is, a, is a tiny amount of money for the real impact that it has on even one person's um, livelihood. The danger of that thinking, though, so, so in other words, the, my answer would be A, but the danger of that, though, is you then ignore B, right? And the, the B gets left to be, oh, it'll be solved if you solve the upstream effects, which will disproportionately affect countries that, or, or regions or people that have the, the money or the ability to access these technologies first. So that becomes a very interesting question. And maybe then that becomes a question which is a, a super interesting question, which is the democratization of these technologies. So if you think about what happened in the internet in the early days, that the amazing work of Tim Berners-Lee and the other group was actually not in the not in the in invention of it, but it was in the standardization and democratization of it so that it could be used as a platform for everything to be built on. And so I think the bigger questions here is how do you make access to these resources? Do you, do you treat this like an internet, effectively, something that, or an energy infrastructure, something that actually can be built on and democratized and accessed by everyone? And that becomes a really interesting question. So open AI, obviously, lots of news. Everyone's talking about it, even people who didn't know about AI talking about it. But it's essentially not open and it's going to be a child for a model, right? The thesis was great, but I think I've, everyone's very worried about how corrupted that will be. Um, so, so I think the question is, is how do you allow these technologies to be open for everyone in the world to benefit from them, which would be fundamentally a great way to solve it rather than just trying to put a, a very small Band-Aid on it. Anyway, that's my two cents worth. Um, thank you. Does anyone want to add? I would like to, he to hear like a more academic uh, opinion as well. I think um, I would very much go for A, so investing in um, a climate solution, so to say, uh, because I think the, the um, effects accumulate so much every year that we are going to be seeing the consequences for every nation, essentially, for a very long time. And specifically, if you think of methane, for example, it has a lifetime of 20 years. But if you think of CO2, it has a lifetime of um, hundreds of uh, years. Um, so I think investing in, in, in number A, so climate solutions, would actually, in the future, hopefully, um, deliver in number B, 
that's at least my opinion. Um, anyone would like to add? I really don't know the either or question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel my, my strategy would be looking, you know, where it's mostly doing, looking where other people are investing their one billion. I think that I would want to make sure that there is investment on both aspects. But I, I do agree that the, the reduction in, in carbon and, and addressing climate change is so urgent, reaching at zero is so urgent, that I think that if nobody was investing in that, then that would be a big problem. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great question. Um, it really draws in the moral element of climate change and the fact that you know, some, certain countries are more responsible than others uh, in this situation. And I'd probably lean towards B, um, given that you know, solutions and technology that will be developed and that will be you know, capitalized and innovated in, in certain ways. Um, and rather than that, I think the point about where is this technology developing, it's developing in you know, the countries that are most responsible, that have industrialized first. It puts a moral imperative to make sure the solutions that we develop are global. And that's why I would kind of shy away from climate change adaptation, because generally it's a very country specific solution. It's like, how do we protect ourselves against this rather than how do we address a problem that has is a global in scale. So um, the reparation side of things, you know, it's very important to acknowledge that certain countries will be affected more, but the efforts to you know, reduce the impact and to solve climate change have to be global. And that's why I think, um, yeah, I would probably say the solutions will be developed. And again, the scale of them is so much that I think you know, B makes more sense for me. Good. We have two different answers. I'm glad about that. <laughs> Can't all agree. <laughs> yes, it's good that we have different opinions and different mm. perspectives. Does anyone want to add anything? Um, good, because now I want to ask, this is a hypothetical about if you had the money, but I want to ask about projects that have been funded. So I, w I would like to ask each of you to quickly give us an example of projects going on where you can see where AI is really adding value um, to this field. Um, yeah, so... I believe you're off. Cool. Um, yeah, so again, uh, as I mentioned, I'm CTO and co-founder of Carbon Re. So that's a university spin-out that we set up two, two and a bit years ago in order to uh, address a problem that I saw. So I've been working in the space for a while and I saw so a lot of climate uh, startups that even if they were successful, they wouldn't move the needle on what we need in emissions. So we need to reduce from 52 gigatons to about 37 gigatons to stay on a path of 1.5 degrees. Um, and again, if you're doing carbon trading, if you're doing kind of emissions monitoring, you're not really affecting how much we're making in the short term. So again, the hard to abate sectors had been you know, on the agenda for a while as you know, difficult ones that if you just electrify, it's not gonna solve their emissions at all. Um, again, so while we know what we're gonna do in transport, we're gonna you know, add renewables to the grid, we're gonna get electric vehicles, and that's how we decarbonize transport. It's very hard to say how we're going to decarbonize the foundational materials. So how we make cement, which is the second most consumed product in the world. It's how people build cities, it's how they build hospitals and homes. Uh, it's essential to development. So again, there's gonna be a lot of uh, cement manufacturing in the developing world, and they need to do so in order to build their economies and to make sure they have the same standard of living of, as everyone else. So it's not fair to say to them, find a different material or to do something else. You have to figure out how you can start making those materials with sustainability, with carbon emissions in mind. So uh, in order to do that, we developed a digital twin of a cement plant and then looked to do optimization of the uh, way that that uh, product is made. So again, in order to make cement, you need to hit uh, temperatures of 1500 degrees. Unfortunately, that means fossil fuels are what you need because the energy density is very hard to replace. You can't just electrify everything. You have to still use fossil fuels to get those high temperatures. So what we've done instead is looked at the variability in the process, looked at where we can make improvements in the system overall. It's a very complex system. It's a stochastic optimization that changes from day to day, which makes it ideal for AI applications. So that's something that we're doing right now that is having emissions you know, uh, impacts in the plants that we're working with. So we're currently working with three plants around the world. Uh, you know, using an API, giving them access to our technology uh, and doing it in a very scalable way that, you know, when we set up the company, we knew we had to hit a certain number of uh, cement plants in order to have the impact that we wanted. And that has shaped the product and that has shaped the technology that we've developed with that ambition in mind. But what I would say generally is that, you know, in order to look at what, uh, what kind of applications people should be thinking about, I can point to specific ones, but there's, you know, there's no limit. Uh, it's only a sense limited by your imagination and by your depth of knowledge of a problem. So I would say to AI researchers right now, look for sources of emissions, look for an area where you think, you know, if that problem was solved, 
the impact would be significant, and then think about what you can do with you know, the machine learning techniques that you know and the problems that you have in order to make that impact happen. So again, you know, you can't think, I couldn't possibly think of all the possible applications. Uh, there'll be people closer to problems that can think of them themselves, and they should be looking to take that and move forward and develop solutions. Thank you. And that, as this is a great, I just saw the other top question. I imagine they wanted to save the planet, but it also saves plants in the way. <laughs> so, so let's hope that. So Maria, do you want to go next? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I would like to mention a project which I think has been mentioned already in this, in this event, which is IceNet. And there's Tom there, uh, who is the first author. And I had the, the honor of collaborating with, uh, with the team led by Scott Hoskin on this topic. Uh, so it's a project that comes from the British Antarctic Survey and essentially is trying to build an AI system that can understand what's happening in the Arctic in terms of um, ice loss. And this is obviously very important because one, flora and fauna in the area, but also there's a lot of indigenous people living there. But also we know now that the Arctic influences to a great extent global climate. So really understanding that relationship and trying to predict what's happening in the Arctic becomes really important to understand global dynamics. And I think some of the most interesting projects that I've seen uh, on this um, topic are around this idea of understanding much better the effects of climate change and trying to project those into the future. And we are seeing right now that all of these uh, physics-based models actually can be fused with data models and improved uh, in this sense. So this is something that I very much like on the environmental domain, but also on the social domain, I've been seeing a lot of applications of AI for democracy. And um, AI is being used in different ways now to query humans and understand humans and understand human values, but it can also be used to understand, for example, political values. And it can be used to query a large amount of people and get an understanding of how the population, for example, reacts to different technologies or to different policies and so on. And for me, this is really important because it, in, it means that we can have greater civic engagement with the decision-making process, which I think will become very important in, in, with the current challenges that we are seeing. Thank you. It's so good you mentioned biodiversity, or, or in this case, weather, um, because that, that is a great example of a very complex interdependent interlinked system with multiple inputs that is perfect for um, AI as a, as a problem set. So, it's, so I think that's where actually it does hold some of the most promise, but then on the flip side, it's also the one that's gonna get the least investment. So because there is an um, immediate impact, right? So you're left to a lot of government bodies, to a lot of regulation, um, and hopefully that is coming, but it is a, a huge risk where, because everyone pursues the ones that can immediately make money, like energy or whatever. Um, so I think that's gonna be a, a, a massively emerging field that, that again, I hope Europe can take a lead on. Um, I think the most exciting things I see are the, what we're now seeing, if you think about startups, right? So I've been w working in solids for 20 years, and 20 years ago it was just software, right? I mean, we literally had a server in the, in the room in Iraq, um, and we would start to build software. We've been doing that for 20 years. And then you had investors who said, oh, we don't touch hardware, um, or I don't want to do deep science, whatever. Now, what you're seeing across all fields, which I think is the most exciting, is the combination of data and AI with massive compute, with tools learned from software, with hardware, in some cases, massive hardware, like a concrete or cement plant, um, and the bringing together together. Even in, in medicine, like, you know, you take the advantages of what happened through the, the pandemic. So the idea of personalized cancer treatments where you take a blood sample, you can um, you know, overnight compute what the exact, literally, injection you should be getting the next day that could knock out that particular form of cancer, which is something that could happen within the next four to five years coming out of the UK. So, and that's not necessarily saving the, the planet, but it is saving the world. But it is a great example of, of bringing these, all of these disciplines together. And, and the startups that we're seeing now are basically multi. And you're a great example, in, which is a fantastic business, is a great example of multidisciplinary teams coming across from everything. I think those are, it, so I, I would say it's not just the application of AI, but it's the application of AI in conjunction with all of these other solutions that is going to be what really saves us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So first of all, I think what Ada's doing is really exciting. <laughs> so I think that focusing on AI on those really hard to decarbonise areas, which are you know absolutely fundamental to infrastructures, is really, really important. So I'm really excited about that work. Um, I'm lucky to be part of an advisory group for Innovate UK and Ofgem, which is UK's energy system regulators, strategic innovation fund, which is all about promoting innovation in networks, energy networks, particularly to focus on net zero, but in a way that uh, sort of supports the consumer ensures uh, you know cost 
effective uh, solutions that can protect the consumer. And they have the ambition of being the Silicon Valley of energy. The UK will be the Silicon Valley of energy. And what's nice about that programme is it's got these kind of co-produced challenges that are shaped by the regulator, the funder, people like me who come from policy backgrounds, uh, people from industry. And one of those is around data and digitalisation. And through that, there's been some really specific uh, examples come through. So the use of AI to create a much more kind of cyber secure digitalised energy system, the use of AI to predict potential accidents in energy sites. So I like that example because it is a very real need to kind of uh, update the network in the UK to protect customers and to solve problems that are kind of identified by the different <coughs> sectors that have part in it. So I think that kind of approach is really great for identifying those areas where AI <coughs> can do something really practical and really kind of focus on a particular challenge. Thank you. I feel like you guys already touched a little bit of this and it's a great segue because I want to approach the top question. Um, if there are any applications that you think that hold a lot of promise but actually are not being uh, pursued enough? Um, yeah, I guess the, the big benefit you get with AI for decarbonization is that it's a software technology. So the scale and the speed of action are really, uh, really critical in this problem that we're solving. So while you might invest in developing a wind turbine that's 10% more efficient, you know, that only applies to that wind, wind turbine itself. Um, so what we what the advantage of with software is that as soon as you have a 5% improvement, you can roll that out globally and you get that 5% improvement kind of scaling in terms of efficiency um, and it's really significant. So I think ways of sharing and ways of adapting um, software tools for decarbonization are really important and an area that should be studied more, whether that's uh, algorithms for the grid that are then more generalizable to be used in um, grids around the world, for example, is, is one kind of aspect of it. But I think it's that larger problem of thinking about how you move from the specific uh, solution that you've solved um, for, say, you know, the UK, and then taking that and making that global is a really uh, big area for adaptation and for usage of AI that I think needs a bit more investment in terms of when we're thinking about decarbonization. How do you take what you've got you know, working in this specific example and then generalizing it to be you know, scalable across the world, scalable globally. And that's kind of where the, you know, the rubber hits the road for a lot of AI. That's where the real you know, work uh, is when you kind of experience that first contact uh, with deploying somewhere else, with deploying in a different problem, and seeing if you can generalize properly. So again, that's an area that, you know, while not giving a specific application, that's something that AI research needs to develop more of that will help with decarbonizing and expanding solutions to have that impact at scale. And I would very much like to give an example of what you just <laughs> said because I find it so good. Uh, it's, 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 um, I really think it uh, simp like simplifies what we could be doing in terms of AI for decarbonization in, a, in such a good way. And um, I spent one month last year being a journalist at Wired because I think we need to interact much more with, with um, the media. And I found this very cool application of what you're just describing, uh, specifically applied to wind turbines and wind farms. So there's a lot that we could do on hardware, as you, as you said, but there's also a lot that we could do on software to actually manage wind farms. And what we see with wind farms is that the farm that is um, essentially at the front affects the farms that are later on in the farm, depending on where the wind is coming from which means is that we are seeing very big uh, losses in terms of energy because of that. And there were these researchers at Stanford University that actually created a software system to manage the, the way that the, the wind turbines are facing so as to maximize the energy that the wind farm would get. And they were deploying this around the world and they found a 3% actually increase in, in energy uh, from the farm. And this is only with uh, software that would actually manage the wind farm. So I think, for example, this is a very good uh, case that if deployed around the world to manage these wind farms, and I think we are seeing the same with solar because solar panels actually interact with each other and project shadows, and if you can move those solar panels in a way that um, minimizes this, we could get much more out of these um, farms. Oh, amazing. That's a really good example as well. 3% is so much when we think about the, the size of these and the impact that this energy has. W would anyone like to add? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's sort of building on the point about scale. So 
uh, where I work at the Royal Academy of Engineering, one of the areas of focus for us is a systems approach to net zero and thinking about the energy transition as a systems challenge. And this also was highlighted by the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology on we need a systems approach. So that's about thinking about the, you know, the interconnectedness of systems for mobility, the built environment, the energy system, but also thinking about this as a kind of socio-technical system about users and, and communities as well. So I think there's a couple of aspects of that that I think are really important. One is kind of grappling with the complexity of that systems issue in a system transition and using the power of AI to help us with that issue of complexity. But I think there's also quite a lot to build on. So, you know, I was listening to the session yesterday on digital twinning and in my previous role was just at the Royal Society. We were looking at digital tech and the planet and that presented this kind of vision of a kind of a digital twin for the planet where multiple connected digital twins can kind of help understand the interactions between systems and knock on effect of change in one place and then create the tools uh, led by AI to optimise those systems, so to optimise supply chains. So for me, I think it's that scaling up, but scaling up in order to take that kind of complex systems approach and to think about this as something that needs change, which is very holistic and is naturally complex and has a lot of interdependencies so that we don't create solutions in one place that might have you know, harm or, or, or worse impacts in another. And I think some of the, I mean, some of the problems that you're talking about that are the style of problem for yeah. decarbonisation are complex systems and interactions. They lend themselves to certain areas of machine learning and, and AI that we're not really developing as much as we should. So uh, naturally, graph neural networks are you know, perfect kind of uh, application for that. But again, if you look at where, say, 90% of the AI research is, it's very much not in that area or in reinforcement learning, which again is very good for optimizing and improving efficiency of processes. Um, that's not what we're working on at the moment. We're working on things like ChatGPT and kind of you know, parlor tricks in terms of you know, what we can do with AI in terms of you know, images and you know, generating you know, different types of, of, um, of chat and all that technology. But where the real kind of impact would be would be really deep research in those, in those um, areas of theory that's needed to solve these problems. And again, you always have this virtuous circle with um, theory and application where applications inform theory and theory informs applications again. But because the AI community has not been focused on these types of problems, there's a real you know, need for, there's a real lack of theory in some of the applications that could have major impact if they were developed further. No, I think that's also applied. And I, what I also love about that is when we talk about AI for the planet, we, energy, I think I'm, we're pretty optimistic on it, will be solved. Then you move on to the built environment, to material. Materials is a huge area, starting with the big CO2 emitting ones like concrete and steel and so on. But you get below that into everything that's made, all of our clothing, everything that we look around us, the changes of that. And then you get into food. And then you think about, um, and I think there's more, much more work that can be done there. I mean, it is so inefficient. You just think about you know, um, how much different types of beans are required to feed, um, you know, and whether it's a plant-based solution or you're putting it into meat. But either way, there is so much inefficiency in those systems that ultimately affects everything we do. And then you think about biodiversity, and then you think about I live I'm very lucky, I live on a farm, and you know and you look at the water. Even just thinking about the water that comes out the bottom end of our stream versus the top end of the stream and where that comes from, these systems are so complex. Knowing being able to model all of those, I would love to be able to apply to it to understand the impact. And it's on a very local, small level. But the point is, is these are where actually I think there's even more promise. And they, then the the, op the opposite of that is, as you said, compared to the parlor tricks. ChatGBT, which is a very nice phrase, um, I might steal that now forever. <laughs> You're um, is is it's these fun I think these fundamental systems. That's where I think some of this has the biggest promise, and we need to work out how do we keep on applying it to that. The only point of I, I, um, positivity I think I can see on there is that there are more and more commercial solutions leaning in to figure this out. Um, generation. Um, Generation, which is a very big financial business, it's an investment business, they started a, a sub, sub funds called um, Just Climate, and one of their next sub funds is entirely about biodiversity. And I think that's probably one of the first examples of financial businesses figuring out or trying to figure out how do you directly invest down here, um, skipping beyond, and they've already got investments in energy materials and so on. So we're getting there, but it, it requires, we can't, what I hope is we don't get distracted by the, the promise of this and ignore all the foundational research and work that still has to go on at so many levels below the ones that kind of apparently where there's loads of money and can be solvable. And that's where the real, to me, that's where the real promise is on a purely personal Thank you. Yeah. And, and um, to add to what Aidan said, um, to what you just said, and to what Natasha said as well, um, I really think that AI for decarbonization is not going to take 
the shape of uh, a carbon capture technology that is just right. out there doing its job, but actually it's going to take, uh, and I think Carbon Re is a perfect example of that because you have an AI system, system actually assisting the human making decisions. So I think building that connection to the human, which could be either a plant factory operator or a policy maker or a conservationist or someone who is working in this domain is really important because we are going to have to enhance the human in a way. These are not technologies that are going to just be deployed and work on their own, right? So I think working on that space becomes really important and we are having immense challenges. For example, if you think of policy making, we were talking before about systems thinking and how it's going to be very hard for our policymakers to actually think of the complexity of these challenges, how they are interconnected, how society um, is interconnected with environment and with the economy and so on. And we have already systems that have that interconnection. Climate scientists, for example, have been working on these so-called social climate models that have this relationship between society and economy. So we could, for example, use those for reinforcement learning. Uh, so we could try to see within those um, environments what would be policies that would actually um, take us to a more sustainable planet. And this would actually help a lot, I think, in terms of supporting policymakers. Because for humans, it's really hard, for example, to even imagine exponential growth or a very complex system where we have a thousand variables interacting with each other, creating feedback loops, and so on. And we have those systems already ready to be deployed. We just need to start using AI within those systems to help humans. It's a brilliant perspective. So your point would be AI for better, making better decisions yeah. is actually one of the biggest areas we can make impacts, and specifically AI for not fucking things up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so instead of prediction of or yeah, hallucination, absolutely. more about decision-making support and brilliant. so on. Yeah, totally. It's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the comms team just had like a <laughs> moment there. It's okay. <laughs> we forgive them. <laughs> yeah, we'll bleep it if needed. Um, I like this because I, one of the questions that, that was asked a while ago at the, on, the, on the Slido was uh, to what extent do you, the dynamics and in international relations actually influence um, and fa constrain or facilitate, basically, uh, the ambitions for the sustainability like social and um, environmental. So how does the fact that we are talking about all of this in the world, but we're not isolated, we have all of these countries or all of these politics, and we talked about as well um, about on the question regarding the communities that are most affected. Um, so how does all of these complex um, relationships influence um, the way things are going? I'm super conflicted here. So the honest, I don't know. But I'll give you two sides of the story, right? So clearly, these solutions are global problems. Clearly, they, we need to make foundational impact that everyone can uh, um, benefit from. Um, so that's the theory, right? The, the reality of the situation, though, is that, <coughs> is that this is becoming more and more politicized. Um, the US obviously has its own internal debates around this. Um, but then, um, as a function of America First and the recent, all the Biden announcements, which are across the political spectrum, more and more money going into them, sucking more and more money in, and being much more nationalistic about it, obviously, as a, as a response to China, kind of the emergence of a new kind of mini Cold War. Um, Europe is now following suit. And as, as a European and as a British person, I've been talking about the, you know, the power that Europe has in this and the, the, like, literally this being the manifestation of it, the massive research base and, and, and power we have. Um, and being frustrated all the time that we can build it very well, but then the Americans market and sell it better. I want Europe to become stronger, right? I want this to grow. I want us to take a lead from it because this is a, a as I've said a bunch of times on a bunch of forums, this is a one in 20 moment, I think, for the climate, for investors, but also for startups and specifically for Europe. So in one way, I want it to be right. I want, I want Europe to take a stand and I want the great things that all the people are in this room to have the backing of a strong you know, force of government that can take do a lot of what the US has done for many, many years. But at the same time, theoretically, that is entirely the wrong thing to do, right? Because you're, you are forcing it to become more and more locked down and geographically. Now, my hope is that over time, this, this competition, this innovation rate just spurs more innovation and that we sort ourselves out in the next 20 years to then go back from it, pull back from the, this mini Cold War. Um, and that's kind of what happened in the Cold War itself, right? There was a spur of innovation, a lot of military industrial technology led to microwaves and everything we use right now, nylon, etc. So maybe it's just a natural span of things. Maybe that's the optimistic part of it. But what I do know is um, the bit I am foundation is that what we do here in Europe, we, are, we should be the best at it. Our challenge now is to turn it out of just the purely research and technology drain to actually make it into the real world. 
at a much greater scale than perhaps we've done in the past. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just to, to kind of add to that point about, you know, competitiveness, there's also, it's, this needs collaboration at a great grand scale. And again, going back to that work at the Royal Society, there was some thinking in that report about how we create community interest companies developing software, how we enable access to data, how we do that, whether it's ma by making data open or by making it accessible sort of safely and securely. <coughs> collaboration is essential and enabling use of technology globally. Um, and I think the, the big question is how we, in, we incentivize and support that. Uh, this is a connected and global issue and, and therefore you know, working together is gonna to be essential to enabling that, it's just so important. Uh, I guess slightly on a, on a negative side, I guess. Um, again, having started a company, one of the reasons behind that was that, uh, and not making a not-for-profit and being very business-focused and thinking about, you know, how do we make this, you know, uh, scale and, and profitable in a way to do it, was that that's how you have impact. You know, capitalism is a great engine for driving change, for driving uh, innovation and driving the kind of uh, scale of impact that we want to see. So while governments and collaboration definitely have a role, the big engine for change and the big engine that's improved people's lives over the uh, quality of life over the last kind of 50 years has been through uh, markets and you know capitalism and, and innovation. So that is, if we're looking to have impact at, scale, at speed and scale, this is something that we need to be doing. We need to be engaging with that kind of business model and seeing what we can do in order to achieve that. But the kind of, the aspect of AI, it, it's, it's kind of, it, it falls between two cases where we have both the, political angle of AI, where everybody wants to lead, everybody wants to invest and be the first to develop this technology. And then we have the you know, climate effect, the political na nature of that, and the impact it has kind of globally around you know, different countries experiencing it differently, and the potential for it leading to you know, inter-regional conflicts around that as well. So obviously solving climate change would ameliorate a lot of political problems that we see in the world, and that is something that needs to be considered when you know, developing those relationships. But we have this tension of people wanting to lead and people wanting to um, shore off different aspects of the research and keep it within uh, the bounds and not share, say, some research coming out of a lab with the US or some share some research with other angles of that as well. But it's important that we're aware of the you know, historical uh, influence of this problem and the need to make these solutions available and to democratize them as well as to drive them in the fastest way possible. I very much agree with, with your perspectives and also with what Natasha mentioned. Uh, I think this um, scaling race is very damaging to the AI world because we should be focusing now on AI safety rather than just scaling huge solutions. Um, there might be many cases in which we already have figured out AI safety and we can scale those solutions, but I find that there's many others in which we haven't. And for example, there's topics that relate to how do we monitor the, the performance of this model in the real world to know, for example, when there's a cyber attack or when there's some issues, for example, because maybe um, the whole climate dynamics have changed and the model that we trained before is not useful anymore. And how do we deal with, for example, robustness of the system with respect to black swan events or things that are currently changing? And one topic that I find very interesting within the AI safety domain is the problem of alignment. So how do we create functions that guide AI tools that are actually aligned with what humans want? And what we've been doing so far, it's really getting proxies that we think that might be in a way related to that, to what we want. So for example, in recommender systems, yes, clicks or the amount of time that you are watching something on YouTube. But we are seeing a lot of unintended consequences that come through the use of those proxies. So that's the problem of alignment. How do we actually find functions that align very well with what you would expect from such a system. And I find this be very hard. And we are seeing that as we create these systems, um, these huge challenges in AI safety become really important because otherwise we see these massive unintended consequences. And what's happening right now is that we think that technology has a life of its, of its own and it cannot be stopped. We cannot stop the current race that we are seeing uh, because if we don't do it, someone else will do it, right? Some other nation will do it. But I think we really need partnership towards slowing down and making it safer so that we know for sure that when we scale these solutions, we, they are not going to bring massive unintended consequences. Thank you so much. Is there anything anyone would like to add? I guess th there's one kind of thing this reminds me of a little bit from when we were starting to talk about transitioning the energy system and what was the right way to do it. And there was this government report that put out 
three different scenarios. And one of them was called um, the kind of a thousand flowers blooming kind of idea. And it was rather than having a large government project or a large government um, program to develop this, that there should just be support put in place for you know a thousand startups to flourish and to kind of tackle the problems individually. And that was the better way. So again, there's different uh, ways of thinking about this, whether you put a policy in, in place that kind of uh, puts out innovation to smaller companies to do it better or whether you need a big scale kind of program to you know bring people together for a critical mass so it is a bit um, it's you know it's not clear whether what's the right way to do these things but um, I'd probably lean towards the former um, thank you we're coming close to an end oh <laughs> um, and um, I would just like to before we leave I would like to ask all of the speakers to just give one sentence of what you think should be the takeaway message from our conversation today? Um, and what do you want the audience, both in person and online, uh, to take and to um, you know, keep in mind <laughs> uh, for the forward? Who would like to start? Um, how many, is that one sentence saying? Um, I just yeah, <laughs> one sentence a, I'm trying, we, we don't have a lot of time. Than, so. than I think it's the systems aspect. And, uh, and I, I think it was helpful for Aidan to point out that some of the technology uh, capacity that could be applied to the thinking of this as a systems challenge is underdeveloped. And th th there is no way you can underemphasize the complexity of the socio-technical nature of decarbonization and the need to think about the impacts of all technologies that we use and the unintended consequences of all technologies we use, whether they are used for, for, particularly for sustainability or not. So tackling that systems uh, challenge and using technology as well as we can to take that systems approach. Thank you. Who I very much agree with, sorry. You <laughs> don't agree. Uh, I very much agree with that. I would go with a very similar response. And I think there's something within AI that it's really under research right now, which is this concept of simulation intelligence. So not only prediction, but actually creating speculation around what if, what would happen if I change this variable and I do this instead. So a bit aligned with the concept of counter counterfactuals. And I think that will bring us closer to the system thinking, thinking and also the interventional nature of what we, where we want to get. So it's not only about prediction, but actually thinking of what is the best intervention in this case. I would, I would probably say this is a message to all the potential founders in the room or people who thought they couldn't be founders. I think this is the time for a new generation of founders, frankly. This is a 20-year moment, as I said. I think PhD researchers, interdisciplinary teams, coming together to solve these huge problems and so coming at it from a problem perspective to the point in which some of these are very big problems um, to come and solve them, this is the time to do it. It's, there's no, been no better time. I think some of the things we'll see over the next 20 years will be even to the, to the sort of sci-fi um, aficionados among us completely unthinkable. And that just is, is very cool and exciting. And if we can solve this huge problem along the way, well, we have to, then even better for it. So I'm ever the optimist. And I would urge everyone here who's doing in research to think about how, what are the applications of that research in the real world at a massive scale to solve some of these problems and just go for it. Because there is no doubt there is a huge amount of money, attention, um, opportunity being pointed at this, this challenge now, which is only a good thing. Yeah, and, and just to echo that, I mean, I think you can see the richness of the space with you know, speakers from policy, uh, investment, and, and academia and research all having you know, great perspectives on AI for decarbonization and showing how much there is to be done in the space. And I guess I would want there to be a challenge to the AI community to be less inward facing and to think about these big problems that need to be solved and what they can do to tackle them. Um, thank you so much. So um, I will close the session here. Thank you so much. Can we get a round of applause to our panelists?